morning. Welcome to our last episode of She's a Force of Nature for the month of August. Um, as, if you've watched us before, you know that She's a Force of Nature is when we highlight women throughout ODNR with careers. Um, my name is Alyssa Yapel and I will be moderating today. So I want to quickly introduce who I have with me today um, before we get started. Uh, I have Jackie. Who, Jackie, if you could wave. Jackie's with our Women's Network, and she's going to be helping me answer any questions that you guys might have today. So if you want to ask our presenters anything, please utilize the Q&A box. Um, I also have Natalie Purvu, who is an environmental section administrator with the Division of Parks and Watercraft. Um, I think she's one of seven administrators with, with Parks, if I'm not mistaken. So we're going to hear from Natalie first, and then we're going to pass it over to Jen uh, Buhite. And Jen is with the Old Woman Creek um, National Estuarine Research Reserve, which is up in Huron, Ohio. Really cool area. If you haven't been there, I'd encourage you guys to check it out. Um, and I just want to let you know that we do have a special episode of She's a Force of Nature on September 13th, and it's actually in part um, of a celebration for uh, Girl Scouts Love State Parks Day. So that's September 13th at 1 p.m. And we're going to have Director Mary Mertz, who's the director of ODNR, uh, Mindy Banky, who is our assistant director, one of our assistant directors, and she oversees a few different divisions. One of them is the Division of Parks and Watercraft. Susie Vance, assistant chief of parks and then Jenny Rohr, who is a park manager at uh, Malabar State Park. So we will have them once again September 13th at 1. I hope you can join us then. And um, let's see, I think with that, we can go ahead and, oh no, I'm sorry, Jackie was going to just explain briefly what the Women's Network does to empower women throughout DNR and what their mission is. So go ahead, Jackie. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, the Women's Network has been established to promote diversity and leadership opportunities at the Ohio Department of Natural Resource. The Women's Network is dedicated to fostering an inclusive work environment while providing networking, mentorship, and professional development opportunities for our employees. Successfully engaging and empowering women at all stages of their careers strengthen our community, inspires innovation, and improves our ability to serve the public. All right, and so now I'm going to send Natalie's screen live, and she has a beautiful background this morning. Uh, that is Marblehead Lighthouse behind her, I think. Um, That's great. <laughs> so welcome, Natalie, and um, so we're going to start it off with a simple question. Uh, what do you do at work every day? <laughs> sure, and I think you started it off perfectly. I work in the Division of Parks and Watercraft, and I am one of the seven section heads for um, the division, and I oversee the environmental section. So my team consists of the trails program, uh, Parks Real Estate, and the Ohio Clean Marinas Program, and that's in partnership with Ohio State's Sea Grant. I directly administer um, several programs for the division. The one that keeps me the busiest in the summer is the statewide recreational beach program. So if you've ever been to a state park beach and you've seen advisory signs up or if you've seen staff taking samples at the beach. That's my program. Um, I'm also really heavily involved with state efforts for harmful algal blooms. So I represent ODNR on a panel with the Ohio Department of Health and the Ohio EPA on making decisions about how we educate our visitors, how we sample lakes for harmful algal blooms. It's really interesting. In addition to those responsibilities, I'm also the um, person with Division of Parks and Watercraft who advises our field staff on environmental permitting. So if we're going to do a big project, um, we're going to be impacting potentially streams or wetlands, 
endangered or threatened species, we need to follow state and federal guidelines. And that means working with the Corps of Engineers, the Ohio EPA, US Fish and Wildlife Service, and the State Historic Preservation Office. Um, I also review many projects for impacts to our state parks, so gas line projects, um, usually utilities that may come through that impact our, our properties. Um, I review projects for impacts to navigable waterways and also assist the Division of Natural Areas and Preserves in reviewing projects for impacts to rare plants and state scenic rivers. Pretty much anything that's nerdy and sciencey is me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, I, I have to ask, um, what is your background then? You're doing a lot of different things. So what what's your degree and um, how did you kind of uh, get involved in all these different areas? Oh my goodness. So we have to go ba way back in time. Um, not to date myself, but it started in first grade. And I remember my earliest memory of really knowing like science is it was sitting on my gym floor in elementary school, first grade, and my teacher, Mrs. Shields, had gotten us all owl pellets. So I don't know if all of you know what owl pellets are, but it's literally owl vomit after they eat. Um, and you dissect these pellets and you see what the owl had for dinner. And I was obsessed. I'm like, this is the coolest thing I've ever done. And I was always that kid who was outside flipping rocks and in the woods and playing in the river. And luckily I have phenomenal parents who always encourage me to pursue my dreams and to go to school and to pursue something I really, really love to do. And I had great teachers um, at B. Cyrus High School who encouraged me to do more. Um, when I was in high school, I won a scholarship to go to Ohio State Stone Lab. So it's a little island up, um, actually close to the White House. Um, near Putten Bay, if you're familiar with Putten Bay, the Lake Erie Islands. And I went and took a week long class and I learned about aquatic bugs and fish and wetlands. I'm like, yep, this is it. I'm done. I'm sold. And I was very lucky because growing up in B. Cyrus right up the road is Tiffin, Ohio. And Tiffin is home to Heidelberg University, which has a world class water a quality lab and they also have water resources major and so that's where I went. I worked for the water lab for four years. I received degrees in um, environmental biology and water resources and after that I went to the Ohio State University and worked on my master's degree in hydrology and here I am at DNR just a couple of years later. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Um, and then I, I actually wanted to ask you one more follow up question before we move on. You mentioned the trails program. So yeah. just in case our viewers are wondering, what is the trails program? Does that mean you are you're not out there building the trails, right? Or but are you mapping the trails and overseeing that? Or what is the trails program? So I have um, working alongside me uh, a fantastic administrator of the trails program his name is tom arbor and what he is working on is we just developed a state trails plan that plan outlines priorities for trail users um, it was months and months of work to get um, ideas from trail users get their opinions to put in a document and now what we're doing is we are following up on their recommendations and one of the big initiatives that DNR is working on right now is mapping all of the state's trails not just DNR trails but also our partners trails so Metro Parks, 
county park districts, township park districts, and hopefully by next spring, uh, we will have both an online web map and an app for your phone so you can get such good information on trails, where they're at, amenities, and um, provide a good user experience. So we're really excited about that. Awesome. So is this uh, kind of like the, the trails partnership um, a part of that or? Yeah, so yeah. we work with a lot of partnering groups here at DNR. We have tons of trail users that a lot of people don't think about. So when we think about trails, a lot of people think about hikers, right? The, the, the folks that go out and walk the paths, but we have horse trails. So we work with the Ohio Horsemen's Council. We have phenomenal bike trails in the state of Ohio, so we work with mountain biking communities. We have snowmobile trails. We have trails for ATVs and Jeeps, off-road vehicles. Um, one of my favorites are water trails. So a lot of times we don't think about our rivers um, as being trails, but they certainly are, and we have a great water trails program here in Ohio. Awesome. Okay, so, um, what influenced your career choice? Uh, did family or school, any personal interests or anything of that sort come into play? Well, definitely that whole owl pellet moment <laughs> was, a, was a factor. Um, but you know, I just always loved being outside and I still do. And I remember, so my parents, I didn't grow up super wealthy, but my parents always took me to state parks. We camped, we spent time outside. And, you know, it's really surreal because I can remember being a little girl camping at Mohegan State Park, going to Malabar Farm State Park. So you said you're going to be talking to Jenny Rohr um, at your next event and going to like the Fall Festival and the Maple Syrup Festival and just loving loving that time with my family, loving being in the in the parks. And I knew that in some capacity, I wanted to work with the public and I would love to work in those parks. Now, when I was little, you know, you pull up to a state park and it has the sign Malabar State Park and underneath it says, you know, right now it says Mike DeWine, governor and Mary Marks, director. And um, I would always think that one day I'm going to be director of ODNR. Now, I don't know if I think that anymore. That's a big job. Um, but just the fact that I get to work for ODNR and I get to play and work in these same state parks that I grew up in and have um, the ability to make a difference is, gosh, that is so rewarding. It's, it really is surreal sometimes. Awesome. Um, OK, so on to the next question. How do you impact or affect the lives of Ohioans? Um, <laughs> so we're kind of looking for what really makes your job rewarding? Oh my gosh. You know, when I was growing up and I had some really good teachers that I've already talked about, but I think school teaches you. They teach you about careers, right? Like. When you grow up, you can be a lawyer, you can be a surgeon and. Um, what what school doesn't teach you about sometimes is the world itself and how much opportunity is out there and how much good that you can do and give back to the world. And I feel like that's exactly what we do at ODNR. All of us together is we have such an impact on our visitors lives. We have impacts that are so long lasting. When I think about the projects that I've been involved with, the, you know, the um, when I worked for the Ohio Scenic Reverse Program as a river manager, I was able to help protect um, river corridor or river land, the land along the river for future generations. And I know that will be protected you know, 300 years from now, that land will still be protected, and I had a role in that. Um, I've had the opportunity to release dozens of state endangered hellbenders, which are kind of a, a big salamander, back to the wild. I've 
sat in classrooms and taught kids about water bugs and you know seeing the looks on their faces when they discover how much cool stuff lives in a river and those are the moments for me that I realize that I do have an effect on the public and I hope in some way that I have a positive effect on my colleagues just like they have on me. I'm constantly learning from them and I have the unique situation of being able to educate others that I work with about environmental laws and protecting our natural resources. So, um, so are you in the field? It sounds like you get out some. Are you typically in the field or are you in an office setting? Yeah, so when I first started with DNR, I was in the field, I was, I would say majority of the time. Um, when I first started, I was doing kind of an internship um, and then got on full time with the Ohio Scenic Rivers program, which is a great program where you're spending a lot of time outdoors teaching folks about high quality river systems. And so those days are filled with um, canoeing and kayaking, uh, stream quality monitoring, um, walking properties. Uh, I took my current position about five or six years ago and as a supervisor I do have a lot more office time but I'm still really lucky because I get to work across the state and I work with all of our park managers I get to visit all of our state parks and sometimes our state nature preserves, wildlife areas, and um, just am really blessed that I do get to go out and do some field work. Sorry, I was on mute there for a second. <laughs> so um, this kind of leads into our, our next question. Um, what motivates you? Oh boy. Um, I, you know, I, I care so much about our natural environment that doing the right thing motivates me. So, you know, it's not always easy to follow all the rules that our state and federal agencies have set up to make sure that natural resources are protected. Um, it can be very complicated. It can be a little time consuming. But when we follow those rules, we're, we're doing the right thing. We're protecting natural resources. And I, I'm proud to be a part of that. Um, you know, the great thing about ODNR and especially the job that I have is that it's always a challenge. I am never bored, never. Every single day is something new for me. I learn something new, I get to see and experience something new. I work with some incredible people um, that challenge me, that make me think differently, that encourage me, and I just love the challenge of, of a new day at ODNR. You never know what it's gonna bring. And last but not least, and this is pretty selfish, um, the outdoors motivates me. There is no place that makes me happier than being outside. And the fact that I get to be outside or have some connection to the outdoors, even when I'm sitting in my office and working on a project, nothing makes me happier. Love it. That's so true too. And um, how can you get bored when you're working on so many different programs? That's so. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so last question for you before you're uh, off the hot seat. Um, <laughs> what advice do you have for others? Um, what do you know now that you wish you knew then, maybe when you were first starting your career? All right. Um, First, I would say is that when you leave college, there's this expectation that you need to be the best. You need to run out and you need to find this awesome job and make a lot of money and quickly climb the corporate ladder and have a house. And 
you know, enjoy the journey. Don't burn yourself out. It'll come. Um, you and I've heard some of the other speakers talk about this as well. Sometimes you have to put in a little hard work to get to a point where you are an administrator or you're a manager at DNR, but it's worth it. Um, it'll happen and enjoy the journey. Go on adventures. Uh, don't let that spark that joy that brought you to ODNR, that love or whatever career you choose, that love and passion that you have, don't let that die out and don't burn yourself out. You have a long time to make some really, really awesome impacts in the world. And it's, uh, I know it's a little cliche, but this is a marathon, not a sprint. So that's, that's one piece of advice. <laughs> Um, the second, uh, you know, I, I went and I took a lot of classes and I was in college for a long time and I loved every, every science class I took. Um, I learned so much about the natural world. And so I learned a lot about physical science, right? And the funny thing is, is that when I came to ODNR, one of the things I learned very quickly is that what I do, yes, does involve physical science. I need to know the basis for biology and ecology, but I'm much more of a social scientist than I am a physical scientist. And what I mean by that is you can know all the science in the world, but if you can't communicate it to the public, to your peers, um, it doesn't matter because if you can't communicate that message to somebody, Having all that knowledge, it, it really doesn't matter. So it's really important that you develop speaking skills, writing skills, because um, those are going to be really important in whatever career you choose. And last but not least is, you know, growing up I had lots of friends, but nobody was like me. None of my friends were in the river flipping rocks or uh, excited about owl vomit. Um, and, you know, you sometimes think, am I weird? <laughs> like, what, what, you know, why am I the only person that's really interested in this? And then I went to Heidelberg and I found people just like me who wanted to spend their free time exploring the woods or fishing or catching snakes. And I realized, oh my gosh, I found my tribe. These are my people. And what's really cool is now being at DNR, I have a whole department of people that are just like me who get excited about finding a snake or a bug or being out in a prairie. And um, you'll find your people, you'll find your mentors, you'll find um, those people that just make you better and you're not weird you just haven't found your tribe yet but you will that is great advice thank you so much natalie and if anybody has questions for natalie she's going to stay on um but i'm going to turn it over to jen now and jen has a presentation that she is going to um share with you guys so jen the floor is yours all right, let's see if this works. All right, so um, uh, as I have found as usual in my life, I took a different route today than Natalie, but she was a great lead in um, because what I do is communicate about science. Um, so I work at Old Woman Creek, which is part of the- uh, Jen, are you sharing a slideshow? I am, it did okay. not work, okay. Nope, I don't see it. Let's try it this way. Can you see it now? Yep. Okay. All right. So I work at Old Woman Creek, which is a national estuarine research reserve. That is a federal system. There are 29 throughout the country. Um, there's one in Ohio, Old Woman Creek, and the goal of this system is to monitor and protect um, our estuary waters and estuaries where 
two bodies of water meet and mix. So in Oldman Creek, it is Oldman Creek and Lake Erie. Um, we are located on the southern shore of Lake Erie. We are actually the southernmost point of Lake Erie, close to Sandusky and well east of Cleveland. And um, our state partner is the Ohio Department of Natural Resources in the Office of Coastal Management and um, the Division of, Area, of Natural Areas and Preserves helps us manage the land um, at our reserve. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to kind of go linear. I'm going to try to go linear on how I got to where I am and some of the decisions that helped me along the way. So I grew up in Michigan. I am a true Great Lakes girl. Uh, and, you know, like Natalie, I had parents that very much encouraged me to get outside and explore. Um, when you have this as your, your view, I spent many a day on the shores of Lake Michigan swimming searching the beach for Petoskey stones. On the other side of that view is a uh, temperate forest. So I was also in the forest, flipping logs, um, looking at plants, uh, watching the animals go by, and just enjoying that free exploration time that kids really need to help develop that um, connection to nature. Um, I loved being in the water. Uh, my parents tried to uh, expose me to all different areas. So we got to go you know, snorkeling. I eventually became a scuba diver. And in high school, I discovered manatees on a trip to Florida. And I fell in love. This is my spirit animal. We're both vegetarians. We like to hang out in the water. Um, and I just, I couldn't, I couldn't get enough. And I, I decided then that I wanted to be a marine biologist. Um, and so I, I finished high school and I ended up going to Hawaii Pacific University. So no manatees there, but um, some of the choices that led me to this school, one, I wanted to study marine biology, but two, it's a smaller school. I'd always gone, I'd gone to small high schools, are a small high school and, and a small school district, and I knew a small school would be good for me. The other thing about this small university is that is our research vessel. And even as freshmen, we were able to get on um, the research vessel, get out in the field and start doing some of the work. Sometimes at bigger schools, um, you don't get to get out in the field until maybe your junior year because you have to get all your prerequisites out of the way. Um, so. Uh, one of my common themes is kind of know yourself and know what will make you succeed. Um, also at a smaller school, I had uh, better access to my professors. And so my junior year, I got to work uh, off of the coast of Maui doing coral reef research, mapping coral reefs and seeing what kind of impacts they were already having from climate change. And this was in the 90s. So again, not to date myself, but um, it was a it was a great time. I learned a lot, um, and um, I had great access to um, teachers and resources, um, and the ocean. So um, my senior year, I got an internship at a state park. This becomes one of those full circle moments because the state park is now a National Estuarine Research Reserve in the same system as Old Woman Creek. Um, but at the time, it was a, a small state park and my internship was to teach fourth graders about coral reefs. Uh, and so I had to design a, an activity, a, a project, um, and then we would go out into the water. So we, um, I had the students make uh, coral polyps out of Play-Doh and then we put all of our polyps together and they made a little colony and we would sprinkle, um, you know, chocolate sprinkles on to act like the, the plankton that they eat. So they understood, you know, the organisms and how they interacted. And then we would go out on a glass bottom boat so that the students could see the coral reef um, and how teeming with life it was. Uh, this was also <clears throat> one of the first times I really took stock and realized that, um, you know, sometimes people take nature for granted or um, or they don't utilize it. And we had fourth graders who lived on the island of Oahu, which is a small island um, that had never been in the ocean before. Uh, and so getting to expose or introduce those children to this really cool thing literally in their backyard, um, it 
it got me. So I decided that instead of the research track that I had been on, um, I wanted to, to think about how can I how can I teach people about science? Um, you know, how can I communicate and, and then explore with with people so that they understand how cool uh, nature is? <clears throat> so in order to do that, I wanted to take a beat and make sure that this was the path that I wanted to follow. So I joined Peace Corps, um, the United States Peace Corps, and I served in the country of Belize, which is kind of up there just south of Mexico. Um, and because I had my degree in marine biology, I was in a coastal town in southern Belize. Um, and there's a huge reef system off of Central America. It's called the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef, which is the second largest barrier reef in the world behind um, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Um, and so I was able to work with students. I ended up teaching at the University of Belize um, at a satellite campus um, in natural resource management. Um, so I had to plan all of my classes um, and curriculum. And then um, I also worked with a local nonprofit that took um, children, youth, students from the villages upstream out onto the barrier reef to again see that connection between land and ocean. For getting our food from the ocean, you know, what is what we're doing on the land? How does that impact um, where we get our food from? And this was kind of my boot camp for for teaching. Um, I learned that teachers have to study and learn just as much as their students, especially if it's a class they've never taught before. I had to teach about limnology, freshwater systems, which I hadn't done as much with coming from marine biology. Well, I taught parks and recreation, so we toured the country with my students on field trips, visiting their natural parks and kind of, um, again, introducing them to the natural wonders of their, um, of their home area. Uh, great time. Uh, I learned a lot, two years of my life. Um, and when I was done, I was like, okay, this is it. I do really like it. I want to do environmental education. Um, so not teaching in a formal classroom, but um, teaching in, in the natural resource area. And I um, wanted to earn my master's degree in it. And I had a couple things I had to think about again. You know, what size school? I picked a small school again. Um, I wanted to have a strong science degree, so it's a, my master's degree is a master's of science, but it has a focus in environmental education, so I could also get some of those education courses that I didn't get in my undergraduate because I wanted to have the best um, background for communicating the science. And I was able to find a fellowship, so many universities throughout the country have Peace Corps fellowships which offer financial assistance um, if you've participated in the P Peace Corps um, so that it was able to offset some of my costs of higher ed. Um, higher education is very expensive. Uh, the know yourself theme is really important. Know what you want to do, know what you want to spend your money on, and it makes it a lot, a lot more worth it in my opinion. Um, so when I was um, earning my master's degree, I worked at a zoo, I worked at a city park um, where I got to see manatees because I was in Florida finally. Um, but when I was done with my master's degree, I had heard about a, a national park in Ohio that had a whole campus designated to environmental education, and that's Cuyahoga Valley National Park. Um, and this is a residential program. I started as a field instructor um, where students come with their teachers, their classes, typically fifth, sixth, seventh grade, and they stay um, three to four nights in the dormitories, they eat in the dining hall, and then all day we take them out hiking and do classes on um, water quality, ecosystems, um, cultural things, so the history of the Ohio and Erie Canal, all that kind of stuff. And again, this was another boot camp for um, for teaching. It was, um, you know, long days. We talked about having to put in some hard yards at the beginning of your career. We often worked 10 hour days, um, but the rewards definitely uh, were worth it. Again, seeing kids, introducing them to nature, um, oftentimes, you know, kids that are 
struggle in the classroom do really well outside. Um, so you get to see new relationships between students and their teachers. It was um, it was really great. I ended up working my way up to being the environmental education coordinator there. Um, <clears throat> and then I was able to um, develop curriculum. I created a summer day camp for the park um, and I was in charge of our field instructors professional development. So one of the things I really liked about this program is that you know it wasn't just kind of um, working your bun off, buns off. It was you got something out of it as well. So I would um, bring in specialists for kids working with disabilities or kids coming from urban areas or rural areas. Um, I would take the field instructors to different kinds of environmental education programs. So we would visit um, the Nature Center at Shaker Lakes or the Science Museum just to kind of see what other career opportunities there were that were still under the umbrella of environmental education. The other thing that I was able to do while I was working here is expand my professional network and that's through some professional organizations. So most fields have um, professional associations where people who do jobs like you, um, you know, can come together and talk about it and share resources. In Ohio, I work with the Environmental Education Council of Ohio um, and nationally, <clears throat> I work with the um, North American Association of Environmental Education. There's a certification program for environmental educators and I coordinate that for the state of Ohio. Um, so I get to talk to people, you know, all throughout Ohio and the country who do what I do and learn from them um, and hopefully share what we do in Ohio. And through that, I met some people um, working with the Division of Wildlife and in ODNR and they um, told me that there was a job opening up um, at Old Woman Creek on the shores of Lake Erie. And the idea or the chance to get to work and live um, on the Great Lake um, was really a big strong pull for me. I love being able to see water every day, um, if not get my toes in it. Uh, and so I applied and luckily I got it. Somewhat luckily, I mean, I, I worked really hard to get where I am, so um, I do I do cherish that. This is an aerial view of Old Woman Creek taken from June this year and is a coastal wetland. You can see the, the creek or the stream comes up from the south there and um, its mouth and, uh, hits Lake Erie. This summer, most of the, the summer, that um, mouth has had a barrier beach going across it. So um, at the beginning, I said an estuary is where two bodies of water meet and mix. They're not meeting and mixing right now, but in the springtime and the fall when it rains more, um, when we get more precipitation, the water will push through and mix with Lake Erie. Um, we have people that, you know, kayak and hike our trails. Um, so it's been a really great job um, for me and I get to see water every day. So my, um, I have two titles. Um, on site, um, I'm the education coordinator. Um, if you're looking at my, um, my work file for DNR, I'm a wildlife communications specialist. Um, and the communications specialists throughout the state um, typically do a combination of, of in-person programming or communication style programming. So newsletters or press releases, um, I would say I'm probably 70% um, in-person programming and 30% um, communications um, in my job. Um, but it is a great mix of things and I never get bored. So we'll go through a little bit of what my job entails um, with some pictures. So we do, we have a K through 12 program. So students um, come on field trips and they can vary from two hours to six hours. We hike through the trails. Um, we typically end up um, on the shores of Lake Erie. And again, um, I get students who live just a couple miles inland who have never seen Lake Erie or never been to the shoreline. Um, so, you know, we we're providing that opportunity to learn about this great resource. Um, Lake Erie provides drinking water for 11 million people. So it's important to know, you know, where your water comes from, where your food comes from, and to just be able to look out um, onto that lake and not be able to see the other side um, is just amazing. 
Uh, we'll get we'll go and turn over logs and trees. This is a dead tree that I have. Um, we often leave those uh, so that they will decay and it provides a great little outside laboratory. You can see one of the little guys there has a magnifying glass so we can look at um, bugs. You know, is it a bug? Is it an insect? How many legs does it have? How many antennas? How many body segments? What kind of plants are we seeing? All that kind of stuff that they can learn not just with me telling them, but they can, you know, tactile touch it and and really get that visceral learning experience. This is an, an older school group, so we do a lot with water quality um, because we have that wetland um, that helps us. One of the ecosystem services of wetlands is they clean the water for us. Um, and so these are students who are at the top of the watershed and they're thinking about if water's flowing under this bridge, where is it going? What's it coming in contact with? Um, How is it going to look by the time it gets to the wetland and then to Lake Erie? I also um, do public programming, so you don't have to be connected with the school to come. Uh, in a typical year, which we all know this is not, uh, we do canoe trips uh, once a week from June, July, and August. Um, I typically have interns throughout the summer. Um, the, uh, Andrew is in the front of that picture. He was an intern a couple of years ago, and the goal for them is to shadow us in the beginning of the summer, and then by midsummer they're leading these programs and getting that educational experience on their own. Um, so the wetland is a great place to to canoe and and kayak and experience the water by land. That's the view uh, looking out the mouth uh, towards Lake Erie. So. You know, one of our big um, messages is is uh, we're a state nature preserve, so our beach is a not a swimming beach. It's for nature, and then it um, often uh, acts as a barrier um, to Lake Erie. We do uh, hikes. This was a birding hike, an early morning birding hike, because you got to get up early if you want to see the birds. We have lots of bald eagles, great blue herons, um, egrets. We have smaller birds um, and we can put up uh, viewing platforms and um, bring binoculars so people can experience um, the wetland and see see all the wildlife that is there. Oftentimes a muskrat will swim by, all sorts of cool stuff. I also do teacher workshops. So another audience that I work with teachers, you know, to maintain their licensure are required to do professional development. Um, and if they're teaching environmental science or biology or anything, um, they need to get um, some professional development in that. So I typically will do one or two teacher workshops a year. This was after three, again, very long days. So they were a little, a little slap happy in this picture. Um, you can also see behind them that the creek is open into um, Lake Erie. So the barrier beach doesn't go all the way across there. Um, but when they come, we get to take them out. Um, we do um, fish sampling techniques so they can learn about the, the food web and the ecosystem within the estuary. So we're looking at what species live there, how big they are. This is a method called electrofishing where we put an electrical current into the water. Um, fish have very simplistic muscle systems, so they're, they essentially get stunned. They float to the surface. We grab them with those nets and we put them in that bucket. They're alive. That bucket has water with bubbler in it. Um, and then we can assess what our population looks like. Um, I also do this with college groups. So, um, you know, Ohio University, Heidelberg, um, Oberlin, they'll all come to get some of those um, practical skills that you might need um, if you were looking for a job in, um, in natural resources. Hey, Jen. Yeah. Um, we had a question from somebody asking how long does it take the environmental educator, uh, how long does the environmental educator certification program take um, if you already have a bachelor's degree? Is there a difference um, depending if you're about, you know, you have a degree or if you're a teacher or is it all the same? It's all the same. Um, this year we're, we took a year off from offering it and we're adapting it to do a little bit like everybody, a little bit online and then some more in person. It takes about a year. Um, it is a national course. It's Ours is focused in Ohio, so it's very much um, Ohio-based ecology and environmental um, science, um, but the standards are nationalized, so um, are 
the their national standards so that um, you know, if you don't work in Ohio your whole life, you could move to another state. Um, you would just have to learn some of their local um, ecology. Um, so it takes about a year. Um, it's on the ECO website, which is the Environmental Education Council of Ohio, um, or you can email me um, and ask me any other questions about it. All right, let's see. Um, another part of my responsibilities uh, are keeping up our visitor center. Um, unfortunately, it is closed to the public right now, but when it is open, um, people can come in. They, we have a lot of touch screens, um, which technology is not my um, bailiwick, my favorite thing, um, but it is part of my responsibility and I have to keep those touch screens working and making sure that people have the access to the information. We also have live animals in our visitor center, so making sure that um, their enclosures are clean, that they're fed, that they have the water that they need. Um, you know, anytime you take an animal out of the wild, um, I want to make sure that we're providing the, the safest, healthiest life for them. Oftentimes, they're going to live much longer in, in captivity in our visitor center than they would outside, but I still am fully uh, I fully acknowledge that it's not their normal life. So this is one of our eastern box turtles. This is our female. Um, we also have an eastern fox snake, um, which is a really cool wetland snake. Um, they're a wetland specialist and I see them out in the wild as well. This one was a rescue. Most of our, our reptiles are rescues. We, we typically don't just take them out of the wild. Um, they are rescued and can't be returned um, for various reasons. We also, have, we also have fish tanks, um, so, you know, we often get people who just like to come in and look at the animals, um, you know, kids that come on school groups, I've seen them many times come back and bring their parents because they want to show them the animals that they met. Um, this is a chance to see them up close that sometimes in nature you don't get to see them that close and all these things can be found, you know, in Ohio. Um, I do also get to help with our research our research program. So we have um, a, a research unit that does research on water quality, um, fisheries, uh, wetlands, and it's very important that I get out and do that stuff with them because I'm responsible for communicating that to the, to the public or to school groups. Um, and if I don't know what they're doing, it's hard for me to talk about it. This is another fishing method that we use. We put it in shallow waters and overnight and fish can swim in. Um, and then we measure them and ID them to see what kind of a fish communities we have. I don't know if you can see that, but kind of down by um, Bill's boot there, there's a shadow in that net. Um, that morning we discovered two snapping turtles in our fishing net, um, eating our data points of fish all night, I'm sure. Um, and Bill was very, uh, very careful in releasing them. Sometimes we have to cut them out of our nets and then I have to sew the nets back up, but um, Bill was brave and got them out without me having to cut the nets. The turtles are never grateful, even though they leave with full bellies. But um, again, it helps us see what our ecosystem is. We also do some um, habitat management. Um, this is one of our volunteers who uh, had done a uh, European frog bit removal day with us. Um, that's a floating aquatic plant, but if you leave it, it'll make really thick, dense mats across the surface of the water, impacting how much light can get through, how much oxygen. So Patty here had filled her canoe um, and we bring it in. So again, working with the public to understand habitat management um, is really important. Um, my impacts, I think, um, I hope are um, you know, getting people, um, I love working with kids out um, in nature and hopefully um, creating that, um, that nature ethic in them, um, that appreciation for nature and what it gives back to us. I take care of our animals. Um, when we had to go into shutdown, uh, two of the turtles came to live with me in my living room. They are back in the visitor center. Um, however, um, you know, I wanted to make sure that when I couldn't be at work, they were still cared for. Uh, again, with the habitat management and impact we have is, you know, making sure that those invasive species um, 
are managed. Um, oftentimes eradication is difficult, but managing them so that our native species can still flourish um, as well is very important. And providing habitat for our wildlife. Um, I will fully admit I did not take this fabulous picture. Um, because our trails go near the water, uh, we have a lot of people that do nature photography at our location and um, most of them are very generous in sharing their images. So this one was was taken um, and shared with me of a great blue heron uh, eating a gizzard shad there, um, but providing this habitat so that our natural, uh, our native wildlife um, can flourish uh, is, is an important impact for me. So by the numbers, um, we have 400 kayakers and canoers um, get special preserve permits to go um, on the water. Last year, we had 5,000 visitors come through the front doors. That does not include people who just hiked down the trails. Um, at this time, I don't have any way to really count them, um, but it is significantly more. Um, I spent 1,400 hours with students um, teaching, um, guiding, um, and learning with them. And we had um, people donated 1,800 volunteer hours. And so that's a really important um, number for me because if people are willing to donate their time, I feel like we have done a good job of making that connection and how important our natural resources are if people are willing to give back with time. My motivation, I love my animals. They keep me um, on my toes, making sure that they're healthy and happy. Um, I just got a new catfish that's going to go in, so um, most fish I don't think are cute, but baby catfish, he's pretty adorable. So he's he just got added to the tank. Um, so making sure that we have good representation of our native wildlife um, that people can see. Again, catfish isn't a fish that you're going to probably run into unless you're looking for them, but um, you can see those, those whiskers and how they develop. So cute. Um, uh, providing habitat. So this year we saw the picture earlier of the great blue heron. This year we had um, great blue herons move in and create a heronry, which is a specific rookery for herons. They built 40 nests in February. This guy is the last of the babies to fledge. Um, he was waiting and waiting, um, but providing good habitat for them definitely motivates me. Natural plants, um, this is hi a hibiscus, it's marshmallow, it's our only native Great Lakes hibiscus, um, and seeing uh, areas where it can flourish and not be overgrown by invasive species is really important. And water, the Great Lakes just being there, um, I love seeing water every day, as I've said. Um, it really nourishes my soul, so that's something I get back from my job. Um, and hopefully I can provide that for other people. And connecting people with our natural resources. This is um, a cold, rainy day, and those kids, we had to drag them off the beach, giving them a chance to just free explore um, within the boundaries um, of, you know, they couldn't go swimming um, or leave the beach, but kids will explore endlessly if given the opportunities. And that kind of free exploration time is super important for brain development, decision making, all sorts of things. Um, and so this is one of my favorite pictures. Um, and that is my presentation. Thank you, Jen. So we have a few questions. Um, let's see, I'm going to start Emma had wrote in and asked how can one become involved in these K through 12 programs she's interested mostly as um, becoming involved as a staffer but she said you know even, she's even interested as a volunteer too well and um, that is a huge um, like tip so if you want to get a job um, start volunteering somewhere they may not have a job available um, we had we needed a part time person um, this year and uh, we had uh, someone move to the, the area um, and, and she had a lot of experience, um, but there were no jobs and she volunteered for us um, all throughout the winter. She came every day. She was diligent. Um, she knew what she was doing. And when that part time position came up, we were like, do you want to apply? Um, so definitely volunteering is a good way to get people to 
to be able to look beyond your resume and say this person is you know diligent they show up they have the skills and it gets you some training that you can take even if a job doesn't open up there you can say you learn those skills um, elsewhere so wherever you are in the state um, you know you can look to your metro parks you can look to um, the science museums nature centers um, almost all of them will be doing um, public programming, state parks, um, and so offering to volunteer, to lead hikes, um, you know, hang out in the visitor center and talk to people, all those things would be a, a great way to get into it. Okay, and Eva wrote in and said, where can I go to sign up as a volunteer? And what is usually required to qualify? I don't have my associates yet, but I will soon. Um, it depends on the agency that you're looking to volunteer with. So for us, um, one thing I didn't talk about is um, I usually also run an Ohio Certified Volunteer Naturalist Program. So if, if you want to get some training in being a naturalist, that's a great statewide program run through OSU. Um, and typically you can find one in your county or close to your county, so you don't have to go to Columbus. So like for Erie County, I do it out of Old Woman Creek. Um, and it's low cost um, and it gets you all sorts of naturalist information and training. Um, most places to volunteer, they don't require that. Um, they typically just require someone who's interested, willing to learn, and able to help. Um, so check with, um, you know, whoever your, your local organizations are. Um, volunteers are hard to come by, and good volunteers are even harder to come by. So if I find one, I try to hang on with dear life. Um, and if people like working with kids, um, that's even better because um, kids can be intimidating, so sometimes my volunteers, they want to work at the front desk, which I totally understand, but my biggest need is is helping me with, with these guys, um, making sure that they have a safe um, and enjoyable trip when they're visiting Old Woman Creek. So if they wanted to volunteer at Old Woman Creek doing something like that, could they email you or what's yep. the... Okay. Yep, we're a small staff, so um, you can email me. And if you want to do education programming, um, I can help you. If you wanted to volunteer in the research program, I can get you to the right person. So if you, someone didn't want to work with kids but still wanted to volunteer in nature, those opportunities opportunities exist as well. Okay. Um, so an another question. These are all kind of relating to to volunteering in a sense, but. If someone's not had an internship involving outdoor education of any sort, how might they get into the outdoor education world? So, you know, volunteering as we've talked about, but, or the Ohio Certified Vol uh, Volunteer Naturalist Program. Um, what about uh, things like maybe Project Wild or, or Project Learning Tree? I'm not sure if those are useful. Can you those, those can be, typically those are geared towards uh, teachers. So um, Project Learning Tree, Project Wild, those are curriculums that are aimed at teachers um, being able to use in the classroom if they can't get out or to augment outside learning. Um, I would say if you want more skills, the Ohio um, Certified Volunteer Naturalist Program is great. Um, the Environmental Education Council of Ohio is another really good one. Um, so those are two statewide programs that have um, affiliates kind of in all regions of Ohio. Often um, if there's a, often at a, whatever agency or organization you're looking to volunteer, they might have their own training program. So like if you're looking at COSI or up in Cleveland, the, the Science Center, um, they're going to have their own training program. And typically they are looking for people who can dedicate some time um, and who are interested um, and doing it and um, they, they may not require you to have, you know, a degree in it or even a ton of experience um, because, you know, that's not your job. But if you want to be a docent or a volunteer, um, they'll help you get there. Um, I don't know anyone who's turning away volunteers. So, so just call them up and, and ask them, you know, what they need and, and they'll let you know. Okay. Um. And one more question, and then I have one for Natalie. Uh, somebody wrote in and asked, what's the cost of the certification program that you talked about? 
Uh, it varies um, per program. So I think mine was a hundred dollars and that covered um, it's 40 hours of in class or in field um, learning. Um, so what we typically did is we would do um, one night a week uh, for two months and then we would do two full day Saturday field days um, as well. So we could get out and do some fishing um, and some other kind of um, field work activities. Um, but each county runs their program very differently. Again, the stand you have to learn the same things, um, but obviously in Erie County, we're focusing more on Lake Erie than they would in Hamilton County. Um, so each one is run a little differently. Oftentimes they are in conjunction with a zoo or a nature center, and sometimes they're through the OSU Extension Office. So um, if you go on the, uh, the OCBN or the Ohio Certified Volunteer Naturalist um, website, it'll give you a list of all the courses that are that aren't going on right now, but will be um, hopefully in 2021 um, and you know who the coordinators are to contact. So it's a great program. You learn a ton um, and it's you know relatively inexpensive um, compared to you know a college course or something. Mm -hmm. OK, and Natalie, uh, I'm going to put you live here. I wanted to ask, so you know, we had a lot of questions about building resumes and volunteering. Are there opportunities to volunteer in um, the Division of Parks and Watercraft? Would that help somebody, you know, that's looking to do what you do? Oh my gosh, yeah, there are a lot of opportunities. Um, you know, statewide, we have over 70 state parks. And each of those state parks is always looking for volunteers, um, whether that be to help with trails, um, with the naturalist program. Um, if you're interested in becoming a volunteer, the best thing that you can do is reach out to the park directly and talk to the park manager. And I know the Division of Natural Areas and Preserves also has a lot of opportunities um, they are, you know, they do a lot of field work, um, uh, events for the public, and um, just another really good opportunity to uh, give some of your time. And we are also always looking for, the Sink Rivers program is always looking for stream quality, stream quality monitoring volunteers. So if you'd like to get in the water, and want to go out and look for water bugs and and provide data to that group um, that's a wonderful way to to volunteer your time and to get to know odnr staff just like jen said a lot of us start out um, being volunteers or interning and those connections that we build lead to full-time jobs awesome well, thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Jen. We are about out of time, so I'm going to wrap it up. But Natalie talking about scenic rivers is a great segue into um, just my little PSA about tomorrow's yeah. webinar. Um, we have the Ohio Wild, Ohio's Wild and Scenic Rivers series, the last one, and we're going to talk about um, why trees are important to streams and rivers and, and waterways. So if they grow on land, why are they important to rivers? We'll find that out tomorrow when we have our um, Scenic Rivers co-workers joining us to, to talk all about our wild and scenic Ohio rivers. So join us tomorrow, 10 a.m. You can find the event link on Facebook. Um, and then just a one click, quick a uh, reminder about September 13th at 1 p.m. when we have our special She's a Force of Nature webinar. So we hope to see you then. And thanks for joining us. And thanks to Jen, um, Jackie, who's been behind the scenes, and Natalie. Have a good one, folks.